whatever. I, I, I love meeting people and learning. Cause like, um, everybody got a story. Everybody has, uh, you know, uh, a purpose. Everybody has a mentality, and I love to learn all those different things and meet different people. And you know, the funny thing you'll find out is I meet people on the carnival ship, and it won't be the last time. I have met so many people that live in a pop that house like Longwood. You know what I'm saying? On the cruise ship? On the cruise. That will see me on the cruise one week, then I get off, and they'll be at my next gig in Sanford or, or Improv or something like that. Just because they saw me on the cruise. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over some stuff though. Um I talk too much. No, 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 no. Cause some of it you kinda answered within the, the thing. Sorry. Because I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask you, what what actually make to in your opinion, what makes a good stand-up comedian? Wow, that's a great question. Um, first of all, being funny. I mean, that's a must. But I'm a different comic. I think I'm like an all-inclusive, you know, all-purpose comic. I want to, I want to, you know, hit all cylinders, energy, jokes, punchlines, crowd work, all that. But um, I think. Being a good rock comic means that you can adjust to all crowds and that you're focused on your actual act. You know, uh, I don't like it when comics get up and just just say a bunch of stuff. Like they don't they don't come prepared. They don't have you know rehearsed material. I'm not saying that you should always just do your set and don't don't deviate from the set or the script. But there is a certain level of skill that goes along with being able to. Leave what you have written down on your phone or on your joke set and just say whatever is funny that comes to your head or to integrate, with the, to, in, to, to uh, involve the crowd. Because I was about to that's something that Ken is real good at. He taught me, you know, learn people's names and use it to refer to them throughout the show. And um, I honestly just think that if you actually work it and work and have an upward trajectory, your, your goal as a comic should not be to just do open mics all your life. It should be to try to get you know, pay work and to travel and to, and to send out. I mean, the thing about comedy is there's a lot of rejection involved. I don't care who you are. We all saw before he passed, God bless the dead, Charlie Murphy bombed at Grand yes. State like hard. Charlie Murphy, Eddie Murphy, brother, bombed. We saw Dave Chappelle bomb mm-hmm. for like three hours straight. Decided, look, I ain't gonna say nothing else. They already paid me, blah, blah, blah. There's no level, there's no a uh, 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 height that you reach where bombing is no longer something that happens. So at any point in time, your career could be over. So I think the good stand-up comics are the ones that can adjust at any moment. The ones that can go into a crowd that they don't think that they can do and can make it theirs anyway. Um, especially the ones that have well thought out, very clever <coughs> jokes. And my favorite are jokes that I look at and I'm like, why, why do you think of that shit? That's funny, but I should have thought of that. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I like to see, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I, you know, I think I consider myself a little different, you know what I'm saying? I think I'm like, I don't know, like half preacher, half Chris Rock, you know, half, I don't know, like, I, I, like, I like to have the energy that preacher used to bring to the stage. I mean, that still does, but I like to have the, the education that Chris Rock has. Like, Chris Rock can get on there and say something you didn't realize was true and then make it real funny. I like to do. I like, frankly, and notice what a part of the question I know I'm going home. But frankly, I've always wanted a platform to speak about the things that I like to speak about. I like to go in front of an all white crowd and talk about Nefertiti, talk about um, uh, uh, how Christmas addicts died in, um, in uh, the Revolutionary War, one of the first people in, in, about, in uh, Boston Massacre. I like to talk a little bit about how the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint the Overture gave us the, the West half of the United States. Because if it wasn't for him beating Napoleon in Haiti when he was trying to take over for, uh, uh, for the French in, the, uh, in, the, in what at the time was called Hispaniola, if he didn't, if Napoleon didn't have to borrow that money from the Louisiana Purchase that that was uh, that was used from the Louisiana Purchase in order to try to beat Toussaint, in which he still lost. They would not, the United States would not have bought the Louisiana Purchase. And everything west of the Mississippi River would still be owned by the French. And so we owe the whole west side of the United States to a black man named Toussaint Overture. And I like to put that in my set. 
But I can make it funny and follow it up with something, you know, silly. Like, yeah, but the Haitians still live in a duplex, you know what I'm saying? With, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with the Dominican Republic. But my whole purpose at first, even when I was trying to do music, was like, yo, at some point in time, I'm going to have a, a platform big enough that I can talk to people about things they don't know. I can educate them on accident. And even shout out both, you know, some, some, uh, some issues that I want to talk about, like, you know, like my homeboy Greg has been missing since January 18, 2020, and don't nobody know, I mean, since January 18, 2000, don't nobody know where he is, but don't nobody care because, I mean, if he's not significant, if he's not famous, you know what I'm saying, or, or, or somebody who has any type of follower, then who's really going to look him up and try to try to find him? And, uh, like, that's one of the things that I, and, and also, I just like to live life to the fullest, and it's just something that challenged me, that can't be taken away from me. I like rap. Where like once you hit 50, 60, I mean Jay Z is like the exception, and maybe two champions. But I don't, you know, I ain't trying to be some 60, 70 year old rapper. You know what I'm saying? LC, like if you listen to a recent Snoop Dogg song, let me not say that I might go for Snoop Dogg. <laughs> I love Snoop Dogg. He's my favorite. Uh, I'm just playing. I mean, but um, he did tell me that he was trying to contact you for a show at the Park Rock. True. I don't know what's gonna happen. Nah, you talking about Snoop from Catalina Park? <laughs> you talking about, talk about Snoop from, from West Coast? Snoop, Snoop Dogg from Rizzle Sizzle? Snoop Dogg. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen after this though. But for real, like think about that though. Comedians, we can work all the way until we die. True. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, freaking, what's the what's the dude that just passed? Um, I mean, that was uh, I can't remember. I feel like there was a comic who just passed. Um, who was a oh, lot of but like you look at like um, Bill Cosby, even though he's a pariah right now, he's like seventy something, and just before he got locked up, he, he was still on stage. Yeah. Um, Dick Gregory performed up until the Oh day. yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I don't see Seinfeld, Chris Rock, Jamie Foxx, Martin, Martin Lawrence. Look, he looks like Big Mama from Big Mama's <laughs> house without the bat suit, and he's still out there puffing and puffing and crawling across the stage. I am not getting booked by any of these folks after this. Please edit that out. Please don't let Martin know. Cameraman. How much I love Martin. Make Martin. sure you highlight that. Hey, hey, man. <laughs> Unless we're getting a cut from the show. <laughs> hey, Martin's cool. Guys. Top five comedians, go. Okay. Um, well my the top of my list, and people surprised to hear it, is um Martin Lawrence. I love Martin Lawrence. And because the uh, well, well, I don't want to give this bitch out of but the rain is I love Martin Lawrence because he was a host of Death Comedy Jam. So he had to sometimes take the energy from being down back up or from up to down. He controlled the crowd. He showed me how to control the crowd. And there's nothing funnier than his improvisation. I'll never forget laughing so hard when he came out on stage with just his drawers on. And he was looking at and yeah. everybody was looking, everybody was laughing. Yeah. He was like, I wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> But the show was go on. Like that's silly. That was and that was genius. Uh, and then, that was genius. And then he, he would he managed to do a show where he was able to incorporate all these characters by himself. Janae, his mama, mm -hmm. Jerome and I, the, the karate dude. Like that's comedy to me. You know what I'm saying? I like it when people use all their talents for the benefit of the comedy. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of hate out there. Like, oh, they want black men to dress up in wigs and to dress up like women. Like, no, I think they just like comic. I think they think it's funny. And make sure you include every Instagram person who out there with a wig on. I don't think that is you know something that they're trying to push on black men. But that's all of a sudden. My next up would be Chris Rock, for the reasons I stated before, mm -hmm. because he can take something controversial and make it funny. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like back then uh, when he did. Um, uh, I can't know if it was bigger or blacker, or if it was more like uh, Brady Payne. But he was like, you know, I don't know what we can dress on here or not. But um, he was like, yo, the difference between black people and, and, and yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like no, that, that's, that's real. Yeah. Like that is so real. Yep. And and you couldn't even deny it because he was being he's yep. not making up. He was like, there's black people <laughs> and then there's niggas. <laughs> 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 yes, now that was funny. Hey, nigga, love that. I hate to not, to not know something. I don't think it's funny. Hey, nigga, uh, what's the guy with Ohio? Man, I don't oh, know that. that. <laughs> Even in red. Oh, you know, no. man, like, that, I would love that. It was, it was hard to say. It was hard to hear. But it was true. And he made it funny. And I love when he does stuff like that. Um, Next up, I might surprise you, but I really like this dude, Adam Sandler. Um. And I, I um, was introduced to Adam Sandler in high school. I was in the band. 
but that was really cool. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't. I well, wish it was Jones, but it was. I fine. mean, in the yearbook, it was like yeah, yeah. color guard. So oh, but, I mean, it, well, oh, oh, I mean, I know the color guard oh, oh, part of the man, oh, we, but you was oh, twirling the flag. Oh, okay, but um, oh, are we roasting? But that was part. That was part of the band. You right? It was part of the band. Oh, my bad. Can everybody be a linebacker? <laughs> Wilder and 
Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, so he like gave most current day comics the blueprint as to how to take your talent and to merge it into other entities as opposed to just stand up. Because there's a lot of stand up comics, believe it or not, that you don't know that are rich that make hundreds of thousands of dollars off stand up on an annual basis, but you just don't know because they have household names. You see, I think in the black community, we not we consider comedy and fame synonymous. So when I say I'm a comedian, your first thought, if you don't know who I am, is, well, I don't know who are you. I, I never heard of you. But that's not the case. I mean, if I say I'm a cook, you're not like, well, I ain't never. So as a comedian, your job isn't, I mean, depending on what your goals is, your job, first and foremost, is to secure the bag. Not just, I mean, and bang comes along with it. Right. We need fame for the money. But I can surely take the money without the fame. And, I, and that's, that's kind of the guy I would want to be. I would want to be the guy who makes half a mil off of my comedy. But I can still walk through the public without having to sign no autographs to take no selfies. Yeah, that's smart. And so that, that's why I kind of like, Richard Pryor showed us how to be famous and he used that to kind of, I mean, he was a Superman. I mean, anyway, but um, I think he was the first one to, he should, if, without Richard Pryor, there'd be no Eddie Murphy. Without Eddie Murphy, wouldn't be nobody I like. But my style, I, I tend to, I, I'm, I think I gravitate more towards black, um, black comics. Um, because I relate to them, you know? It's not that I don't think, there's some really funny white guys and some white girls and, and some people of other, uh, uh, you know, of other nationalities that are pretty funny. Um, I happen to think that, uh, you know, like Lisa Wong, you yes. know, she, she's not bad. And, um, I really like Joe Coy, and I like um, Russell Rest. Uh, Russell, Rest- uh, <laughs> Russell, what's that dude named Russell? I don't remember that. Um, <clears throat> I said Adam Sandler is pretty funny, but um, when I, I when I grew up, uh, when I was growing up, I grew up on black stand up. I didn't see black. all I knew was Def Jam, BT Comic View, you know. So I based my comedy off what I grew up, you know, watching and. That's kind of where I am today, but I want it to be universal, so I don't do just black crowds or just dirty crowds. I want to make sure that anything that you hire in comedy for, I can be considered. That's why my range of, of comedian tops is so diverse. I'm sorry. So something that I didn't know about you when we started earlier, I said I felt like I know you, but then today I found out something that I didn't know, and it was that you used to, just joking, Oh, <laughs> about days is that you are a police activist oh. and I had no clue about that because I'm wondering how is it being a police activist and you have like a really good friend that was on the show Brody Love oh, yeah. who's actually a police officer so yeah. you know how does how does that work out like how well I wouldn't call myself a police activist I would say I'm, I think what you mean was a political activist Okay. Um, and I, you know, what what that really is is just uh, it is weird with, with Brody. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes I got we, me and Brody go on the road. I be like, Brody, you got to turn your headphones. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I'm about to have some better. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but but um, it's really not that. It's to me, it's a no brainer. Like I was, I'm I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, all right, originally. You know, before I moved down to Florida. I was raised in a completely segregated area where I did not know what white, I never saw white people unless I went to the to this Cardinals games or to the zoo or to the arch. Um, my whole neighborhood looked like me. It wasn't something, you didn't have to be ashamed of being intelligent and black at the same time. It was a, it was completely, culture, it was a culture shock when I moved down here. But one thing I learned very early on is that you have to speak up when things are wrong. My father took me to my very first protest when I was four years old, I was in the news. We were marching around over something called police brutality, believe it or not. This is in like 1984, 85. You know what I'm saying? I'm marching around with my pops, who also is very vocal in the community. So I think I inherited this. Um, so, you know, it's, really, it's really not something that I put my mind to. It's something that's it's like a natural intuition or instinct to, you know, to just, if you can do good in some area, to do it, you know, don't. I learned a long time ago. I ain't gonna try, I ain't trying to get Dr. Phil on you. But I am somebody, right? Which
which means whenever I sit and think to myself, yo, this is wrong, man. Somebody ought to do something. Somebody need to do somebody. At one point, I had to say to myself, yo, you are at somebody. Like, why are you waiting for somebody else to do what you need to be doing? And that's when I decided to pick up my mantle, get up off the couch, leave from the barbershop, talk about all this trash about how everything's wrong, and to get up and get out and try to make a difference. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes just your support of something can be instrumental. But it wasn't, you know, you ask me, like, how does that work? It has to. When duty falls, we all would like, listen, we are not in Lake Mary right now. We're in Eatonville, Florida. And, you know, there's a completely different demographic over here. If a little black boy over here gets shot by Brody Love, then we're going to get up and we're going to make sure that the police department know that we about that. But if we don't, they're going to think it's okay. Right? When Trayvon Martin lost his life to some wannabe police officer, I considered that to be my brother, my son. I was like, I have to get out in front of this. And so me and a lot of folks I know started organizing, started getting people, bringing people. Al Sharp, you know, whoever it is that we needed to bring to town to shine a light on this issue, we started to put that together. And we don't want to take credit, we just want to see difference. Right. So I rarely, I rarely will, you really see me like posting like, hey y'all, I'm the one that organized, you know, I don't, it's not about taking credit, it's about having results. Because in my opinion, everything that goes wrong that I could have changed is my fault. You know what I'm saying? Right. If I don't make the world better for my kids, then I can't be mad at people because I'm relying on them to do something that I should do myself. You see what I'm saying? And also, I'm gonna be real. I'm not afraid of a spotlight. I'm not afraid to be out front. I'm not afraid to start up some stuff. I'm not afraid to lay out in the middle of the street and stop traffic. I'm not afraid to speak up about something that's that's a travesty. Um, I, you know, especially, and, and that was that was a really hard few years for me because being from St. Louis, but living in the Orlando area, I watched Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown get gunned down by people who had no business cutting them down within the same like year. And that's two areas that hold my heart. So you gotta understand my soul was away. And I just felt like I'm tired of complaining about stuff. I need to do something. And so I, I decided to pick up that mantle and again my parents were instrumental in giving me that um, that, that um that lack of fear to just speak when necessary. That's how that was. I mean, but it doesn't clash with like, bro. You know, I, 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 people think that uh, being against police brutality means you're against police, and that's not the case. Uh, do I like to see my rear view pale now? But I'm not anti-police. I'm anti-police brutality, brutality yeah. excessive force. You know, and they're not they're not mutually exclusive. You know, me and Brody like been the best friends, and I never you know he gets that at least a year more. And I wish him success, but he also talks to me about how he tries to minimize violence. And I have mean, respect. Yeah. We talked about that when he was on the show as well. So, there were some other questions that I wanted to ask, but, I but we have definitely run out of time. So, you have to come back. I don't know. You have to come back and visit us. Absolutely, man. No question. I wanted to ask. So, you're a traveler. Yo. And you have traveled to many places, many countries. There's out to Mount Sanford, Longwood, Lake Parish, Pine Hill, Hill. And the park, uh, Catalina Park. And, and don't forget APK. But if you had to tell me which, you know, which country was your favorite and why was that your favorite? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, well, as of this moment, there's two different. Um, that I would say. I would say England, surprisingly enough, one of my favorite places because everybody's it's so nice. But second favorite is gonna be Thailand. Thailand. Thailand, you can get anything you want for like 15 cents. Like everything is so cheap. Man. And I mean, and, and everybody's so nice. It's like the whole country is like Publix with a hint of Chick-fil-A. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody just, just is, overly catering to you and I mean there's so much country to, to explore and again the fact that it's inexpensive just makes it all the more wild now favorite country to perform in I'm gonna say thus far has been China 
Beijing has more black people than you do in Asia. I had no really? idea. Really? I had no idea. And they all over there speaking English, and not a name one of them probably speak proper English, but they hire for English speakers. <laughs> they over there like, all right, listen, kids, today's word is now, all right? Uh, now. now. Like, you don't know now. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I would say that those are those are the first three that come to mind uh, with London, with uh, England being on the top, just because it's so historic. The people that are so nice, and I mean it's so clean too. In most of the places, not all of them, just some of the areas that you see in Top Boy, but um, it's it's pretty dope. And I, I look forward to going back there, but I haven't been everywhere yet. And I look forward to going to Africa this year. Right. Nice. A couple other places, but I'm back to Top Boy. Uh, so it was a pleasure, man. Like really. Nah, 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 no, uh, no, uh, 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 but we definitely got to have you back on the show because it's more. I think people need to hear more of what you have to say. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's a, you know, it's important. I'm actually talking about you getting serious. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh huh. Yep. Yeah. So. <laughs> I ain't playing with you, man. I love you, my lady. So, if people wanted to follow you, see what you got going on, where we can go see your show, where you're gonna be at. I mean, gotta be in the U.S. because I mean, I. Until next time. She Googled that, y'all. She didn't make that.